before pivoting and going into a full rollout of a new or improved product or service, create what is known as a minimum viable product. This product has all the core features that will make the product work. The purpose of the minimum viable product is to test the demand by getting feedback from the customer. Now, this is beneficial to the business because it saves costs as it reduces remake and it builds a relationship with the customer because they are involved with the process. And finally, customer research is important because it guides how you can tweak your product or service as feedback helps you determine if your existing strategy as it relates to price or product is really working as you intended to. We are now going to look at three simple but powerful and accessible tools which can be used for customer research. Does anyone remember CVM Television's tagline before the current one? Yes, no? Okay, I'm told that you're all muted. So I'm sure you remember it though. It's looking in, looking out, looking even better. And I want you to always bear this in mind when you're thinking about how it is that you're going to use research for your business. Because in essence, this literally describes how research can benefit a company, as well as it describes some of the methods which can be used to achieve this. So pivoting must be driven by indirect or direct feedback. In this case, feedback from potential or existing customers. So let's look, in at, let's look at looking in that option. This involves examining data already available to you. That is data generated based on your business operation. Now, this is free and valuable information that when analyzed effectively can show you what you're missing, what is doing well, what is underperforming, and the available resources and skill sets which you can utilize to pivot. Looking out would include the use of surveys and the internet. And the internet option includes social media, government data, market research firms, et cetera. So now we're going to look a bit closer at each of these options. The most powerful research tool in your arsenal as a business, 100% hands down, is your own data. So it's all that stuff living in your spreadsheet, hiding out in your surveys that you'd have done in the past and just chilling there in your client report. That is excellent data. With a little work, you can dive in, you can explore, and you can really extract valuable information about what is and isn't doing well. Internal data, which can be used for this purpose, would include your sales information, your marketing information, and your physical and human resources. The sales department can provide data on revenue and profit. Understanding these numbers gives a business the opportunity to maximize what works as well as cut some areas. The sales numbers can be broken down further by analyzing how sales relate to price points. So is it that you generate more sales at one price versus another? And what about customer sales in different geographic areas? Are sales less in Spanish town compared to Portmore? In essence, you want to find out what does your sales numbers tell you about your customers and their preferences. For example, a company is selling two types of hand sanitizers, one with the added benefit of a moisturizer. As the company breaks down the sales for the month of March, it is determined that the option with the moisturizer sells much faster. This internal data tells the company to continue making adjustments to try to improve sales by increasing the production of hand sanitizers with added moisturizing content. The marketing component, you can look at your website traffic statistics. What about your food reports and your promotion cards? What marketing techniques do your customers respond to best? Look at your resources, physical and human resources. What are the underutilized or misaligned human resources which can be leveraged to pivot? How can you maximize these resources? 
What other functions can they serve or can they com complement existing products as well as services? Now, one of the more popular methods used by businesses for customer research is what is known as surveys. Now, quite often persons confuse surveys with questionnaires, but they are really different. A survey is a method of gathering information from a sample of people. So say, for example, you wanted to conduct a survey in a Washington Gardens, Kingston. It probably has a population of, say, 500 persons. But you really don't have the resources to conduct an interview with 500 persons. So you want a representative sample of persons living within that area. And those persons will form your survey or the persons that you will provide a questionnaire to. So this survey is a method of gathering the information from that sample that you would have selected. The questionnaire, on the other hand, is best thought of as the instrument that you use to carry out the survey. There are four modes of survey data collection that are commonly used. Yeah, face-to-face -face surveys, telephone surveys, meaning that you call someone up and you ask them questions over the phone. It can be self-administered using paper and pencil. So you provide them with a questionnaire and they answer it there and then. Or it could be self-administered computer surveys, meaning that it is done online. Now, fortunately for us, with everything that is happening with COVID-19, we can't do face-to-face -face surveys with our customers, but we can do online surveys. And tell you what, now is an exciting and opportune time to find out what your customer expectations are, because things are changing every day and rapidly with the crisis. Also remember, you're not just researching to get you through the crisis, but you need to figure, figure out how this crisis will change your business model going forward. Again, these are exciting times to touch base with customers because now you can get faster insights. And what do I mean by this? Everybody is online. You now have easy access to the market and online surveys can allow you to target your customer segments easily. There is no need for travel or expensive setup. So this will also reduce your cost. You also have access to larger samples. Remote tools enable you to get insights from many people at once. You also have access to more diverse samples. Geography and travel often limit who we can include in a study, but with remote research, Doing it online, it allows you to reach participants across the globe. And this is especially important if you have customer segments across Jamaica and outside of Jamaica. But before you get excited and go online to conduct a survey, there are some things that you must consider. For one, how do you go about selecting your sample of respondents and how do you recruit them? you first need to consider where you can find your customers or potential customers. Is your target population online? If a large proportion or a large portion of your target population is not online, then an online survey won't be a good fit. If you have phone numbers available, you can send phone messages to these persons or you can call these persons. If most of your target population is online, then the main consideration is how to reach them. And there are numerous ways by which you can do this. You can use their internal resources again. If you have an email list of your target customers, then you can easily send them an email with a link to an online survey. Other options include engaging people as they visit your website. So sometimes you go onto a website and the first thing that pops up is a survey. You can use that option or after a point of sale. You can also use third-party marketing lists. If you do not have a list that provides the entire population you want to research, consider whether it is possible to purchase a third-party marketing list. You can also use technology to reach specialized populations or niche markets. You can try placing targeted 
ads online. For example, you can use Instagram and a Facebook boost I know is very popular. With these platforms, you are able to limit the ad to specific subsets. So if it is that you're interested in persons of a particular age that live in Hanover, you can select those as the criteria for your ad. You can also use online panels. Online panels are a sample of people who have agreed to complete surveys online. They typically allow you to target respondents based on demographic information such as race, location, or gender. With online panels, you'll find that you capture a large amount of data within just a few days or a week. And uh, the bonus again, uh, with online uh, surveys or research, you don't have to just limit yourself to doing uh, surveys. You can also do face-to-face, -face, well, you can also do interviews, you can do focus groups. So it is not limited to just questionnaires. Just to share with you some survey tips that you must always bear in mind. Make sure you have an introduction. Too many times persons open up, and open up a survey and isn't told what it, what it is about or why they should complete it. While the title can give the person a basic idea, more details will help. And why is this important? If a respondent knows the purpose of the survey and they find value in it and it is enticing, they are more likely to complete the survey. It also helps to determine that you're actually getting information from persons who you're interested in. Include demographics. So normally surveys will start off with a series of demographic questions. What is your age? What is your sex? Your education, your income, email, etc. But unless the rest of the survey depends on these questions, sometimes it's better to leave this set of questions to the end. This is because sometimes persons find this type of information to be intrusive and they aren't always comfortable answering these sort of questions at the start of the survey, especially if they're not sure if they're going to complete it anyway. They're more likely to volunteer this information once they have seen that the survey is legitimate and have taken the time to fill it out completely. So a, bit, a better route sometimes is to start off your survey with more interesting questions that capture your respondents' attention and really encourage them to complete the survey. Offer your respondents choices, choices, choices. Providing respondents with a variety of choices for a particular question is a good idea, but ensure that you keep it within reason. You don't want to give them too many choices. Too many choices can confuse individuals and it will only complicate the post-analysis process for you. If there are a lot of possible answers, you can use what is known as the other option or please specify a choice. Limit your open-ended questions. Now, open-ended questions can be good, can be valuable because it sometimes brings out ideas that you didn't even think of. However, there are downfalls. They are likely to yield very vague and brief responses and sometimes persons just don't answer at all. They can't be bothered. So when you're going to use open-ended questions, ensure that you use them sparingly and strategically. Also, test your survey before sending to your customers. Having a group of individuals test your survey can highlight errors that you may have missed and help to make your survey easier to take. Once your survey is live, you don't want to be making changes and possibly affecting your responses. So going through a testing phase beforehand is definitely crucial. Make your surveys succinct. And I use what is known as a KISS approach, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simply short or keep it short and sweet. People have short attention spans, and especially when they're online, two seconds and they're moving on to something else. To maximize responses, your surveys should be straight to the point and be as short and succinct as possible. And a lot of times when we're doing surveys, we like to think, oh, well, we're doing a survey, so we might as well ask them all the questions that we want to. No. Ensure that your surveys is 
five minutes the maximum and if you're going beyond this time frame you should try to incentivize it offer them a reward or incentive do not collect tone deaf data know your customers and don't be out of touch with what is on everybody's mind for example you shouldn't begin collecting data now on travel rewards or destination weddings when there's a travel restriction in place on the other hand if you want to gauge your consumer brand sentiment at this time, that would be relevant and appropriate. Do not send your survey to everyone, please. We know you want as many responses as possible, and the larger the sample size, the usually, usually the better it is in terms of being thorough and representative. However, you also have to make sure that the respondents to your survey are relevant to what it is that you're trying to determine or the business decision that you're trying to make. If you're conducting a survey for a baby story, you may not want individuals without children answering as they could skew your results. So target the correct individuals with your invite and don't seek responses for the sake of responses. Make sure that they are actually adding value to your survey. And these are some of the popular survey platforms. They're all open source, they're all free. So you can just take these down and when you have some time, you can check them out. Most, as I said before, have a free option available, but you can usually upgrade if it is that you want to access other components of the platform. For example, if you want assistance with statistics, um, analysis of the data, etc they usually have upgraded features available. But generally, I find that the free option that is available is pretty suitable for the sort of research that a startup or small businesses would like to conduct. So you can take a note of these. Now, the other source of data that you can use for research or the other research tool that you can utilize is the internet. Now the internet is a wonderful place and it's excellent for businesses today which need to gather data on the way that customers are behaving in real time and, and, and in an unfiltered way. We know that persons on social media don't have a filter, right? Social media has reached a point where it is seamlessly integrated into our lives. And because it is a digital extension of ourselves, people freely express their opinions and thoughts. Because people share so much content on social media and the sharing is so instant, social media is a treasure trove for customer research. There is plenty of data to tap into and dissect. You can also use what is known as social listening tools. And these are able to identify topics of your interest and then analyze relevant social posts. For example, you can track mentions of your brand and what consumers are saying about the products owned by your brand. Because it is unprompted, you can be almost sure that what is shared is an accurate account of what somebody really cares about and think about or thinks about. You can also analyze customers or potential customers' interaction with your website to help with pivoting. So how long are they staying on your site? What links are they clicking? What triggers them to share your content on social media? What are they uploading or downloading? And what time are they doing this? The businesses that are here today you'll find are the ones that harvest this sort of data they blend and analyze the real-time customer data that is being shared on social media. And this helps them to identify patterns and predict customer needs even before the customers are aware of those needs themselves. For those businesses that are strapped for resources, are those simply seeking to support the research that they have already done? Public data is an excellent source and it's usually free of cost. They're useful for market research. You can use government databases. You can use polling data. And again, a lot of this is free. In Jamaica, you can solicit information from the customs agency, from Statin, from KIOJ, and other institutions, even the JBDC. 
Market research firms also exist locally. Again, you can tap into their resources. You can look at what it is that they have on their website in terms of what are the growth industries and what is it that customers desire, how, when, and where do they want these desires to be filled. So you have now completed your research and you have analyzed your data and you decide that it's time to make this pivot, right? Now there are numerous ways that a business can pivot, but today I'm going to focus on how it is that you can pivot by diversifying the customer channels to reach your customers. What about offering new products and services or augmenting what it is that already exists? And finally, how is it that you can tap into new customer segments? Now, just to note, there is no one way to pivot as your pivot may span all three or it may be a combination of one or two. So let's look at them a bit closer. COVID-19 has caused businesses to pivot from in-house dining, referring to restaurants, and ordering to providing curb pickup and deliveries. Now, grocery stores, their experience, they're having the same experience. They have seen a surge in business, and a lot of consumer activity has pretty much migrated to the digital space. This has opened up opportunities for delivery services. So it's for you to think now, how can you benefit from these changes? What internal resources do you have which can be leveraged to take advantage of these new challenge channels, the online channels, the curb pickup, the deliveries? How can you tap into this opportunity? Contactless technology is another area of opportunity. With many people viewing money as unclean and potentially infected with COVID-19, there has been an increase in contactless payment usage. For example, a survey was done locally since the outbreak of the virus, and 30% of consumers have used contactless payment methods for the first time. 30% of consumers have used contactless payment methods for the first time. And of this 30%, 70% indicated that they will keep on using this technology beyond COVID-19. So how are you going to factor this in your business going forward? How are you going to use this as an opportunity to pivot? For businesses that depend solely on face-to-face -face consultations, how can this be changed to virtual consultations? Could be for interior decorating or even fitness training. Do you need to pivot to a new product or service, or is it best to augment an existing product or service? One of the positives of this outbreak is the renewal of the message that we can collaborate to be great. So we see now where a number of businesses have been working with others to help improve business continuation, as well as to improve their offerings to customers. So it's really a win-win. We now see farmers collaborating with restauranteurs, food processors, and online delivery service to relieve themselves of excess produce caused by the literal shutdown of the tourism sector. Mailpack has developed a partnership with PriceMart to deliver purchases made by PriceMart customers. Persons in the nutraceutical industry have been pairing their products with natural immune boosters so that they can add value to their customers and maintain sales. Some companies have improved the potency of their sanitizing products, while others have started using their existing machinery and manufacturing plants to begin the production of ventilators, masks, and other in-demand supplies. If you're planning an upcoming workshop or event, you can pivot with your customers in mind. Is it possible for you to create a virtual version of this event? Or is it that you really need to postpone? postpone. So polls and questionnaires, surveys, etc., is a great way to get honest feedback from your ticket holders as to what it is that they want you to do about this event. The important thing is don't assume you know what your customers want. Conduct the research, get the feedback, and from there you can pivot. You can also consider tapping into new customer segments. 
when tapping into new customer segments, again, you have to conduct your research and know your customer profile. The elderly, for example, may not have access to or there may not be technological savvy, even though a lot of products and services are migrating to the online space. So how is it if it is that you intend to serve the elderly? How are you going to accommodate their needs? Use the market data published to find out industries or businesses experiencing supply chain issues. What are the gaps and how can you fit in? Mighty Spice Limited, for example, that's a local company. It's a small business rather, specializing in natural herbs, herbs-based meats and fish seasoning. They had a good start to 2020, but with the outbreak of COVID-19, by the month of March, they nosedived 85% amid everything that was happening. But in the midst of the business downturn, guess what? An, opp an opportunity came up. In mid-July, when grocery stores and shops ran out of imported brands of natural seasoning, guess what? Guess who they turned to? Local suppliers like Mighty Spice Limited. So, it's really for us to look at what is happening in the, in the industries, do the research, see what persons are saying online, and try to figure out if it is that you can serve another customer segment. What about our supply chains? How can you tap into that? Now, when you get in, or when you have now reached out and you are now serving new customer segments, segments the research does not end there, as you know how to ensure that you get all the details because you want to put yourself in a favorable light that at the end of COVID-19, you can still maintain this new customer segment. Ensure that you're maximizing your contact with your new customers so that you can revert to that internal data at a later date to upsell other products and services that they may be interested in. Think about how it is that you can use existing technology to create niche markets by helping persons connect. So we know now with social distances, we can't really connect with each other physically. So more than ever, persons are really seeking to connect over social media platforms. And you think about Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and the other platforms, and you're wondering what role can you play because they really can't complete, compete. But what persons are doing now, they are creating Facebook groups as business opportunities. One marriage council, for example, has created a, a Facebook group for marriage therapy by the name of Marriage Under Quarantine, and their tagline is My Marriage Will Survive Coronavirus. And this is a paid, this is a paid, um, this is a paid group. It's not free, right? So persons are being innovative and thinking, looking at the gaps and seeing how those gaps really present opportunities. If it is that you're into technology or you have an application, how is it that you can use the freemium model to tap into new customers? Can you offer discounts to get new customers to come on board? If your organization offers technological solutions, which are in demand now, you can consider free upgrades for a limited time. You, can, you could also make paid features of point of sale system like online ordering and e-commerce available to new customers at a discounted price for a limited time. So these are some of the options that you can, you can consider to get new customer segments into your business at this time. As I've stressed, pivoting has to be customer focused or else you'll run the risk of developing something that neither the market nor the customer need. When pivoting, you want to focus on your customer profile and use that to create value for them. So having done your research, what is this saying to you now? What is it that the customer is trying to get done in their work and in their lives? What are the pains? What are the bad outcomes? What are the risks that they have to contend with? What are the obstacles? And what are the outcomes that customers want to achieve or the concrete benefits that they are seeking? 
when you're pivoting in response, in response to these customer pains, you want to think about the pain reliever that you can offer. You want to describe how it is that your product or service can alleviate the customer's pain. Think about your products and services. What is the value proposition that you can build around these? And what are the gain creators that will describe how it is that your products and services can really create customer gain? Now, when you have done all this, you will achieve a fit. You achieve a fit that is fitting the value map with the customer profile. When your products and services produce pain relievers, so the customers are experiencing pain, what is the pain reliever that you're recommending? What are the gains? What can they benefit from this product or service that you're offering? What is your value proposition? Now, even as you're considering your value proposition and your pivoting, this is not done in a vacuum because we have competitors, right? And if you think that your idea is so novel and there are no competitors out there, you need to think again. So even as you come up with your own value proposition based on the research you have done, you also have to research a competition that exists and determine what will distinguish your pivot from the competitor's business. So is it the performance of this product or service that you're offering? Is it the quality? Is it the price? Is it the brand or the status that it creates? Or is it the convenience? Or is it accessible more than the other options that are available out there? What is the customer experience that goes with this product or service that you're offering? Let's now look at an example of how it is that we can pull all of this together. And we'll use in a, a company, a local company, by the name of El Salvido. El Salvido is a day tour operation in Jamaica. And it pivoted and created value for a new segment of customers. Remember, we spoke about that before, how it is that you get new customers in at this time. Now, with the outbreak of Corona, of course, booking stopped coming in and management started looking first within to determine what can they do now to ensure that cash is still coming in. So the first thing, they look for new opportunities and new customers because they can't depend on tourists, right? Here is the reasoning. If COVID has caused demand for tourism to drop, Logically, it must have increased demand for something else, right? That is just logical. And guess what? It did. Those who were more vulnerable to the disease, such as the elderly, had a significantly higher risk when going out to purchase their groceries or medication. Hence, there was a growth in demand for deliveries. Their next step was to look at their core resources, that is, what are the human and physical resources that are already available? And how can these be used to provide a service? So El Salvido has a fleet of vehicles and tour guides, and this pretty much placed them in a the perfect position to start providing the service. After all, their guides, they're used to providing great customer service. All they had to do now was to train them as it relates to social distances. And of course, based on the other measures that would have been implemented by the ministry. It also looked at additional resources which they could leverage. So El Salvador is a well-established business in the area. Using their connections, they built relationships with supermarkets and wholesalers who now provide them with the goods for delivery. They also realized that the elderly often had relatives living overseas. Relatives would often want to, want to purchase goods to be sent to their parents or grandparents. As they already had an online payment option, what is it that they did? They simply reused the payment gateway to collect payment from overseas for their new delivery service. So you see what they did? They looked at what is available inside. And remember that these are the services, the resources rather, that are available inside 
inside the organization. They still have to pay for those resources. So why not find a way to use those resources to pivot into probably another business model? So we understand that not everyone will be in the position to do this. However, at the very least, there'll be one thing that you'll be able to do differently with the resources that you have. For example, some hotels in Jamaica, they're considering turning into temporary hospitals. As you look to pivot, ask yourself these questions. What are my core resources? Especially the ones that I'm still paying for, but not using. And how can I use these to provide a new service to new customers? So to demonstrate what it is that we have discussed earlier, I'm going to share with you a brief survey that I'd like you to complete. And here's the background to the survey. Pat operates a retail honey business by the name of Shiloh's Beehive. Since the COVID outbreak, sales have fallen off as persons are mostly interested in the purchase of essential items such as food, cleaning products, and productive gears. But of course, this is Pat's main breadwinner. This is our bread and butter. So she has to figure a way how it is that she's going to do some sort of pivoting because she needs some money to come in, right? So before we go to the survey, David, is it possible to unmute persons so that they can share how they think that Pat could use some of the techniques that we discussed earlier to pivot? Amanda, we can ask them to just stick up their hand instead of opening everybody's mic because oh, of the background, right? So once you have shared the survey, persons who have questions, just hold up your hand and we'll acknowledge you and then you can go ahead with your, with sharing how it is that you question that Amanda asked, all right? Okay, but before, because I don't want to give away some of the thoughts that mm -hmm. Pat has in mind, so I want to hear first how it is that they would suggest that Pat could possibly pivot. Okay, so participants, what you can do is look at the center of your screen in the participants panel, pick raise hand, and then you can go ahead and share. I'll acknowledge you and you can go ahead and share. Nobody wants to share? All right. <laughs> Not a problem. Continue with your presentation. Right. Very good presentation. Am I okay? Uh, somebody I'm wants to share. Paula. Thank you, Paula. I'm unmuting your mic. Please go ahead and. Sure, this one is hard. It has a specific product, which is, is it's just left field compared to where persons are, are looking. However, if you think that the, the persons want to remain healthy, because you want your immune systems to be up and honey can be marketed under the whole nutraceuticals umbrella where it, it, it helps. And I think there are some benefits in that way. Then perhaps Pat could look at rebranding so that she comes not just as plain honey, but more under help to strengthen your immune system, etc., which will be in the place of health and wellness, which is of a concern. How's that? Excellent, excellent, excellent. I'll get back to your response. Thank you so much, Paula, for that response. I see two other hands. Sancho? Yeah. Yes, I'm Amory, you can go ahead with your question. I've I unmuted think, your mic. I, I was thinking, in addition to what was just said, she could add like how you could combine it with other healthy products like garlic, lemon, just to give people idea how they can enhance an already healthy product. Indeed, thank you. All right, J Jordan, I've unmuted your mic. You can go ahead with your question. Yes, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, so given that this is an excellent presentation and research, 
I just did a quick um, secondary research myself and I realized that honey actually has skin moisturizing properties. So to piggyback on what you said earlier, Amanda, um, what this company could do is partner with a company that is doing hand sanitizers and supply them with honey um, to get that skin moisturizing properties um, with the hand sanitizers. Thank you, indeed. Those are excellent answers. And in fact, Pat is thinking about tweaking, rather, tweaking her message to communicate to customers the natural antioxidant and antibacterial properties of honey, which can help improve the digestive system and boost immunity. And it is also a powerhouse of antioxidants. So definitely, and her new tagline for this season it's B, and as B E E, be happy. Give your body a fighting chance against COVID nineteen. So your answers were all in line with that. And as you also mentioned, she intends to augment her product by adding immune boosting additives. So really excellent. Thank you for those responses. So what are the next steps for Pat? She is considering secondary research using the internet, as you did, Jordan, to find out how other businesses would have gone about doing this, what are some of the additional options she can consider, as well as she will send a survey to her existing clients. So I'm now going to open that survey to you, who are all pretend clients of Pat, and I'd like you to quickly go through, it should take you less than two minutes, and answer please as honestly as possibly as possible and all your responses of course will be anonymous okay so giving you two minutes to quickly complete this survey So again, as a reminder, Pat is a retail honey seller and uh, she wants to pivot her business because cash flow has really decreased since COVID-19. She intends to add immune boosting, boosting additives to her honey as well as she plans to tweak her message to communicate, communicate to customers the natural antioxidants and antibacterial properties of honey. So this is the second phase of her pivoting process where she has sent out a survey to you, her existing clients, to find out what your thoughts are as it relates to adding some sort of immune booster to her honey. Nine seconds remaining. <laughs> Three seconds remaining, and we're almost there. I'll give you a little more time to complete. Probably another um, minute. David, a couple of persons are saying that they are unable to submit the survey. Can you check and see what the challenge is with that for me? Some have already submitted um, so far, so I'm not okay, sure. Okay, so somebody's saying that you have to set, select a second location, then you can submit. Okay, all right, they're getting through. They're getting through now. Good. Awesome. All right. Fabulous. I think Paula's hand is up. All right, there are a number of hands up. Okay. One second. I'm going to give Terry and Henry a chance and then I'll go to Paula. Terry? Hi. 
Hi, morning. How are you? Thank you so Very far. Well. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I think your data is going to be skewed because the the location. So if you submitted some, if you try to submit something on the first page, when you get to the second, it's not allowing you to submit. So you probably need to check that. So you end up having to select a parish on the second page in order to submit. Um, that's that's one thing, yeah. Um, and then outside of that, I wanted to make a quick comment in addition to what persons have said before. You had mentioned earlier um, the fact that places like Mailpack, because she doesn't have to only consider her strategies in terms of what she can add, etc. But persons are not coming out to shop as much, so even considering how she will get it to them. So partnering also with places that are doing deliveries might also be something that she might want to look into. Yes, thank you for that response. I definitely agree. So you see, there's so many different ways that we can pivot and so many different factors that we can consider. All right, Amanda, remember we have a question from Paula. So sure. Go, okay, I'm gonna unmute her and let her go ahead. Okay. It was ahead, the same Paula. thing, just... It was the same thing, just saying okay. that option eight, if I don't select option something from option eight, I can't submit. And if I select from option eight, I would be lying. So the results, option eight needs to give a none of the above ah, option. Thank you, thank you. And we apologize for the issues related to that. So this is a learning process for us all. So just to bear that in mind. And hence the reason why it is so important to test before, right? Oh, I forget. <laughs> I totally forgot. Okay, great. So I think we can cut off now with the whole day later. And let's look at what this is saying. Ah, can they see the results? Okay. So we can quickly go through the results. What is your first reaction to the product? 39% said very positive, 52% somewhat positive, 3% somewhat negative, and 6% said neutral. For number two, when you think about the product, do you think of it as something you need or don't need? Interestingly, 55% said probably need. If the product were available today, how likely would you be to buy the product? Somewhat likely, 48%, that's encouraging. How likely are you to replace your current product with this, with this product? 39% said somewhat likely. All right. So definitely, this is some useful information that Pat can use when she's considering how it is that she will pivot. In addition to this survey, she could delve a bit further to find out why it is that some persons were neutral in the first instance when they heard about the product, as well as she can have a Zoom interview or focus group discussion to really add substance to some of these results that are presented here. Because on its own, it's just data numbers, but usually you want to get a deeper understanding as to what is it that is motivating the thoughts or the perceptions of the respondents. So you can move this to phase two, where you can move into doing a focus group discussion or interviews with your clients as well to get a deeper understanding before you pivot. So here at JBDC, we did a bit of research using surveys and the internet to find out how cost consumers are responding to the current pandemic. And what is the data showing? Shopping behavior is beginning to evolve. Consumers are more responsive to marketing messages, including emails, text messages, social media, etc. And online shopping is definitely on the rise. Survival essentials are top of the mind for consumers right now. Consumers are prioritizing buying food first and foremost but also products that promote health and wellness, including supplements, superfoods, and items like thermometers and medication. 
respondents also wrote that they're looking to buy water and interestingly, beer and liquor. Consumers also care about availability more than brand right now. So if products are unavailable, many consumers said that they would turn to less familiar brands as options. Some said they would wait until the store restocks their preferred brand or they try other stores to find them. And other persons have chosen to sign up for product restocking updates. As consumers are exposed to new brands and new products due to whether it's budgetary constraints or whether it's related to supply chain challenges, you're going to find that new habits are being formed and brands that better suit their lifestyles may be of more interest to them right now. But guess what? These can also carry over to post-COVID-19. So what does these trends mean for your business now and post-COVID? What are the pivot pivoting opportunities for you? So to wrap up, it may seem like the world has stopped for your business, but there are still opportunities. Those opportunities may have shifted significantly, but your business must shift with it. And as we say in Jamaica, we are free, we will come again. So research creates value for your customers and your business. Use research as a data collection tool to learn about your customers. Also use research as a validation tool for your ideas. This will save you money by allowing you to develop the minimum viable product and test before you go to market. It allows a greater likelihood of business success. Make sure your research is relevant and targets your intended customers. Use your internal data, develop surveys, and use the internet to find the pain points of customers and develop a customer-centric response. You can pivot by using new and innovative means to communicate and deliver your products and services. You may develop new or augmented or augment existing products and services as well as you may pivot your message. And uh, that came out with the example of the honey. If there's no interest whatsoever in your product or service at this time, the best you can do is to really look inside and try to reorganize your company and help your customers in the best way possible and ensure that you're prepared for something like COVID or other, I'm sure, other things that will come about eventually. So while at, the end, while at the end of the virus, we really don't know when that will happen. We don't know what the horizon is like right now. There are still many proactive measures that businesses can take to help themselves bounce back. So think about what the next three months, six months, or nine months will look like, and try to prepare for that new landscape because things will change significantly after this episode of COVID has passed. That takes me to the end of my presentation. I really hope it was useful to you. You would have learned a thing or two. And I do hope you'll be able to implement some of these strategies that I would have suggested to guarantee success for your businesses. Excellent presentation, Amanda. I hope um, our participants were taking, they were taking some notes because you brought out quite a lot of important points during your presentation. I see where there is a hand up from Jordan, and I'm going to unmute the mic, Jordan, so that you can go ahead and ask your question. So, um, that was a lovely. Go ahead, go ahead yeah. Jordan. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, good morning again. That was a, just a lovely, lovely presentation. I learned a lot. Um, but I have a question. So when doing a self-administered customer um, survey online, right? Um, how you exercise control over the geographical location. So in other words, how can the administrator be certain that they don't lie about where they live? Or is there just no way to know that? Well, as it is no Jordan, depending on the platform that you're using, for example, if you are using like a Facebook booth, for example, to do a 
survey or not Facebook boost, but the another research option provided through Facebook because persons would have to put in their geographic location when they sign in or create a Facebook account. We'd want to think that that is one means by which we can verify that it is indeed that location for the person. But again, that is not totally accurate because persons can use whatever address they wish to on Facebook. And it's the same thing when it is that we administer surveys. In truth, there is no real method by which you can validate unless possibly you call the person to validate their location. But really there is no control. You have to pretty much just trust that persons will input the correct information. And that's one of the drawbacks to doing online surveys rather compared to doing face-to-face -face surveys. Because when you do face-to-face -face surveys, they are out there in the field. And sometimes you possibly do it at the person's home or business place. So again, this highlights some of the shortcomings in using one method versus another. Thank you very much, Amanda and Jordan. And just to inform persons that the recording of this particular session, as well as all the sessions that we've had before, they're available on the JBDC's YouTube page. We're encouraging you to follow us on YouTube JBDC Jamaica, and you'll be able to access all of these presentations. Subscribe, and you'll be able to access all the presentations. Paula, I'm going to unmute your mic so that you can go ahead and ask a question. Thank you. The question was with respect to the, the survey that we just did, the little survey for the, the honey product. Do you think the challenge with the responses for the product could be because we are not the right audience? Or maybe she would need to, to find... Yes, normally be using question. nutraceuticals. Okay, thanks for that question, Paulo. Indeed, that is correct. And that's one of the reasons why it is so important that your research or your surveys are really targeting because you don't want resp responses on persons who don't have an interest. However, in this case, because this group weren't necessarily her existing clients, what she would do preferably in her scenario is to send a survey to existing clients. So persons who would have purchased before persons who have an interest in probably using organic foods or nutraceutical, nutraceutical options. So again, targeting for customer research is definitely important. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amanda. There's another question from Simone. I'm going to unmute your mic, Simone, so that you can go ahead and ask the question. All right, great. Thanks, Anthea. Good morning, everyone. Just wanted actually more to comment more than ask a question, just to say again and highlight the importance of uh, customer research. And I think that Amanda did a great job in taking us through the, the process. Um, what I also want to point to is the relevance of customer research as it impacts the customer experience and the customer journey as you take them from, I mean, the, the initial starting point to the purchasing point, because that of course helps you in, in directing your message. Paul just pointed to a very good thing in terms of is it your is it the correct target audience and of course you being able to determine exactly how you position your product or your service um, an important aspect as well of customer research and i'm this is me thinking out loud is also how it impacts on the employees the persons on the back end or really the front end who are who are handling the customers who are dealing with the customers because i find that there are great source and wealth of information in being able to determine how we move forward in terms of how we position how we market products, how we sell products at the end of the day to ensure that we have full customer satisfaction. Thank you. Thanks again. Great job. Thank you for that insightful comment. 
And just to refer to the question which Jordan asked, I had mentioned one of the tools that can be used is a survey monkey. If you have a premium option with that platform, you're able to use geotagging to an extent to confirm if it's well, the location of your respondents. But generally outside of that, there is no real way to confirm if persons are actually using their correct location. All right, thanks, Amanda. There's another question from Tanya Batson. Tanya, your mic is unmuted. Go ahead with your, with your question. Um, uh, good day, everybody. Thanks for the presentation so far. Uh, my question um, comes off of the back somewhat of Paula's question as well as the survey itself. Um, the survey was supposed to be speaking to an existing market. Um, but I know that in a lot of times, I would imagine that that product, you wouldn't be selling to a lot of direct consumers. You would likely have been selling um, to supermarkets, gas stations, whatever, wherever. Um, so the thing is, if you are a company that usually sells through other customers, and at this time you're looking to pivot to be able to sell more directly, um, what are some of your survey recommendations in terms of helping to find out who exactly your customers are? Because outside of stores, you may not have as great a handle on who some of your direct customers are. What are your recommendations for that? Let me paraphrase to confirm that I understand the question. So in this instance, it's not a survey that will target the direct customer, but rather you're selling to another company or another business? No, I'm saying the challenge is I don't have a great handle on who my direct customer is because I normally sell to a store, but now I want to sell um, to the end consumer instead. What survey um, techniques, et cetera, do you recommend for me to try and find um, those potential direct customers? Okay, so it's the opposite. Well, uh, in this case, I would suggest that you start by doing a map of the potential or the customers that would normally purchase from the business that you sell from. So it's like you're doing it backwards. And for example, now, I understand. For example, if it is that usually I am a farmer, I would send to sell to the supermarket, but they are no longer taking my produce at this time. So I'm going directly now to probably persons who would um, purchase my uh, input for food processing. Okay. So okay. So so you're saying map out who your potential end users are, right. work that out, and then try to find the ways in which you target them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And also, and when you're doing okay. that process, do you want to ensure that you look at the demography of each customer segment? Because the demography will be different and also the channels by which you reach them will also be different. So you have to always match those. So it is not to view it as an overall customer segment, but what are the subsets, subsets of that customer segment and how, what are the different challenge, channels rather, that you will use to reach each of those subsets within the larger customer segment. Okay, um, Suzanne, you posted a question. Suzanne Thomas, that is, you posted a question in the chat. I'm not quite sure I understand what, what you're saying. So if you could just, just recalibrate it and send it again, and I will ask the question for you. Um, Carrie Ann Willis, I'm gonna unmute your mic so that you can go ahead and send your, ask your question. Ariane, you can hear me? This is not really a question. Just um, in relation to the question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, we are hearing you, Ariane. Go ahead. Okay. 
All right, carry on. Just go ahead and type the question in the mm -hmm. chat and we'll respond. In relation to the question, you know, really connect with your diffusion outlet. Uh, uh, how can you reach the 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 I would say is I'm not hearing the question, stand still. I'm not hearing it either. That's why I was telling her to go ahead and post the question in the chat and then we can look at it from there. Mm -hmm. Carry on, just post the question in the chat and we'll we'll take it from there because we're not hearing you properly. All right, another question from another carry on. Carry on, Henry, can you hear me? Carry? Yes. All right, go ahead. All right, I'm the carry on, sorry, in the house. Yeah, um, I have quite a number of them. <laughs> right? Okay, Um. it was, it was more of a a comment as well as a thought that perhaps the community could weigh in on in that I'd heard something in a previous JCDC session and this is for Tanya in relation to her question and it was a very powerful discussion topic where they were talking about you know who is your tribe and so for everybody who has a product really and truly you do have a tribe of persons who are either interested in what you're doing or they are able to also and rather to pass that on so i don't know if for example tanya is aware of even a few people who she knows whether from direct sales or um word of mouth coming to her who actually purchased her products already and even starting from there and then um going out to say okay and are you aware of anyone else in your circle who uses that product or who would be interested or who do you think would be interested so she could also use that method to kind of um coalesce those persons and and also you know use that as a strategy what's that thought thanks for sharing carrie Anna. What about carrier number two? Her question is... All right, she is still trying to join. It seems as if she's trying to rejoin the meeting. Maybe she's having internet issues. Mm -hmm. um, so if she comes back up, I will, I will, I will ask her question. Um, just to give out some info, remind the persons again that you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, JBDC Jamaica. And you will be able to access all the recordings of all the sessions that we have done so far. That is the JBDC Virtual Business Zone, Biz Zone, as well as our JBDC In Concert series that is held for the creative and cultural sector on Thursdays. I am also going, going to post information as the helper can get in contact with us. We are still available via email at info at jbdc.net. Our contact numbers are 876-550-1167 or 876-414-3376. And of course, we are available on social media. We're very active on Facebook and on Instagram. So if you can't reach us at any of the other direct like telephone numbers or via email, you can always message us on social media and we will definitely get back to you. Okay, is there any other question from anybody else? Any other question or comment? Okay, if not, we want to thank everybody for coming out today. And yes, we did come out. Um, so join us for refreshments right after this. <laughs> All you have to do is just go to your fridge and you, you'll get your refreshments from there. Thank you so much for having joined us today. And come back with us on Thursday. The information for Thursday's uh, presentation will be sent out shortly. Hopefully you are all on our email mailing list. And as such, you'll be able to access the information for Thursday. Thanks again, everybody and have a great rest of the day. Bye.